Hello and welcome to the Political History of the United States. Episode 4.3, The End of Pontiac's Rebellion. When we left off last time, we saw the colonies in a tenuous position. They had managed to hold on to Fort Pitt, Detroit, and even Niagara. However, their victories were more the product of the Indians themselves needing to hunt, rather than any decisive military victories. In October of 1763, command of the British forces in North America would change from Geoffrey Amherst over to Thomas Gage, who would see out the remainder of the war effort. With Thomas Gage now in command, the plan for the moment, militarily, was figuring out just how to bring the conflict to a close. This is a war that nobody particularly wanted. On the ground, the colonial governments were not showing any real enthusiasm or patriotic zeal towards putting Pontiac down. War was expensive, and after just having completed the conquest of Canada, nobody had any real taste for it. Back in Britain, the situation was much the same. They had just come out of a truly global conflict that had massively increased the amount of national debt. George III was not interested in expending additional resources to put down an Indian uprising. To that end, the king issued a proclamation in 1763 that clarified that settlement to the west of the Appalachian Mountains was barred. The problem with this is that it barred individual settlements from moving west. However, it did not apply to the British army. Should the British want to establish garrisons to the west of the proclamation line? Well, that was just fine. Furthermore, even amongst land speculators and potential settlers, there seemed to be little enthusiasm for actually following the king's proclamation. The proclamation line of 1763 would mark the beginning of a dramatic shift in British policies towards their colonies. As in London, they sought to manage their vast North American empire. When we return next time to discuss the increase in royal control over the colonies, we are going to come back to this proclamation line and what it really meant for the colonists. However, for today, I just want to make sure that you're all aware that it now exists. Following the winter months of 1764, the war that emerged for the remainder of the year would prove vastly different than what we had seen in 1763. The story of 1764 is not going to be one of large battles. There would be no bushy nor bloody run. There would be no battle of Devil's Hole. Rather, the war would be defined by a mixture of mutual atrocities and deft diplomacy. To begin with the former, we find that the frontiers in Pennsylvania are in danger of complete collapse. Along the frontiers, colonists again found themselves in an unfortunately familiar spot. Those living along the frontiers existed in a state of near-constant terror of Indian attack. They knew, from years of experience, that these attacks were brutal when they came, both in their destructive power and in their speed. Burnt farms, scalping, and kidnappings were all par for the course. The fear and anger over the instability of the frontier would lead to an outbreak of violence that would prove to be both widespread in its effect and brutal in its application. Recall that the Pennsylvania authorities had only authorized the use of men for defensive efforts. However, for some colonists, this was a wholly inadequate response. Their farms were being burnt. Their families kidnapped and murdered. They were not looking for a defensive war. They wanted the vengeance that came with an offensive war. The colonial leadership, specifically Governor John Penn, the grandson of William Penn, wanted to avoid further escalation of the war that would come from an offensive campaign. Concerned about potential punitive attacks, Penn went ahead and placed a group of Moravian Indians under his protection, housing them near Philadelphia. This move by Penn was incredibly unpopular, and from the point of view of the frontier settlers, was a completely tone-deaf response to the realities along the frontier. On December 14th, 1763, a group of approximately 50 settlers from Paxton, Pennsylvania, located near modern-day Harrisburg, decided that they were going to do something about it. 
led by their minister, John Elder. They marched on the Indian village of Conestoga, located roughly 10 miles south along the banks of the Susquehanna River. It was there that this group, which would become known as the Paxton Boys, proceeded to kill six members of the Conestoga Indians. Penn, horrified by what had occurred, ordered the arrest of the men. Meanwhile, the Paxton Boys were not done. They wanted to finish the job that they had started at Conestoga. When they had attacked on the 14th, at least 14 other members of the tribe were not in the village. They were instead further south in Lancaster. The sheriff in Lancaster moved to protect this group of Indians from the approaching mob, moving them into a workhouse. On December 27th, the Paxton boys arrived in Lancaster. Despite the sheriff's attempts to prevent the mob's entry, he was assaulted and injured in the process, which, in turn, allowed the mob to gain entry, where they would murder the remaining Indians. There was an unquestioned brutality to what had happened in Lancaster, as men, women, and children were counted amongst the dead. Penn, desperate to get control over the rapidly changing situation, offered a reward for the capture of the group's leaders. However, Penn quickly learned from a Lancaster magistrate that he had a much bigger problem on his hands. The Paxton boys were growing, and now a mob of some 200 men were marching towards Philadelphia. Rumors abounded that they were looking for more than just those Indians seeking refuge in Philadelphia, but also had designs to attack the Quaker population, whom they viewed as being complicit. These fears were significant enough that Israel Pemberton decided that it was time to get his family out of town before the mob arrived. What had started as an attack on an Indian village just weeks before now became a serious risk to the colonial government in Philadelphia. The assembly quickly moved to begin taking defensive measures to protect the capital, as rumors of the mob size quickly became inflated while spreading like wildfire through the increasingly terrified population. Benjamin Franklin, helped organize the citizens to defend the city. The mob reached Germantown on February 5th, 1764, coming armed with rifles and tomahawks. There, they halted and sent Matthew Smith and James Gibson to represent the group. For Pennsylvania, they chose Franklin, Joseph Galloway, Benjamin Chu, and Thomas Willing to meet with them. The representatives of the Paxton Boys issued an explanation of their grievances. They explained that their anger was over what was a seeming disconnect between the Pennsylvania leadership and the frontier settlers. They complained that their families had been kidnapped during the French and Indian War. Yet, the Pennsylvania government was not seeking the retribution that they so desperately wanted, but rather they sought friendship and a restoration of the peace. In other words, you are calling these Indians our friends? yet they continue to attack us. The Paxton boys demanded that the Indians be removed from the settled areas of the colonies, that those who had been kidnapped by the tribes be released, and that until such a time, all trade with these tribes should be suspended. They likewise called for a stronger frontier defense, that those injured in Indian race be provided care at the expense of the colony, as well as for increased representation for the interior areas of Pennsylvania. Following making their demands known, the group dispersed while they awaited a response. This is not to say that the Paxton boys ceased to be a problem, as what would soon develop afterwards was a pamphlet war that would engulf Philadelphia. As this season goes on, we are going to talk a lot more about the power of the pamphlet. These events in Pennsylvania at the beginning of 1764 were an early example of a trend that is going to become a defining feature of the coming era. The Paxton boys have remained as more of a mere footnote, largely because we know what's coming. The story of the Paxton boys today tends not to focus on the darker tones of the story, including the brutal killing of those Indians, nor the demand that Indians in the colony be removed from it. Rather, the point of focus tends to be split between the pamphleteering and the mob moving on Philadelphia out of pure frustration towards colonial policy. 
the Paxton boys are not going to meaningfully reassemble. They really did just disperse after Germantown, and we are not going to see them march on the city again. In a vacuum, the event is a tragic but unremarkable moment. However, in the greater story of the next two decades of American history, the Paxton boys are a very early precursor to the coming events. The men from Paxton were an early example of mob action against a British government that they felt was not listening nor addressing their grievances. The Paxton boys aside, the events of December 1763 were hardly the only time that we would see shocking acts of violence in the coming months. As winter gave way to the spring, the Indians would again resume their campaign against the frontier towns. There had been attacks near Fort Cumberland and Fort Loudoun in May and June 1764, which resulted in the death of over 50 colonists. However, those attacks were dwarfed in colonial outrage by an attack on July 26. It was on July 26 that four Delaware warriors entered a primary school and butchered everybody inside. Of the 13 people in the schoolhouse, 12 children were joined by their teacher, Enoch Brown. The only two survivors were two students, a young boy and girl. Both were seriously injured, having been scalped. As they left the schoolhouse, this group of Delaware came across a pregnant woman who they killed and scalped in a gruesome display. The brutality of this was shocking for pretty much everybody. Even among the Delaware tribe, the war party was denounced as cowards for attacking children. The colonists in Pennsylvania were furious and demanded there be a swift and harsh response. Governor Penn had little choice. He was going to have to respond. The path that he chose was to bring back scalp bounties. Per the new bounty system, the scalp of a male Indian over the age of 10 was worth the equivalent of $134. A woman's scalp was worth 50 Scalp bounties were not unheard of in the colonies and were often used following particularly brutal attacks. The last time that we directly talked about a scalp bounty was during Queen Anne's War, following an attack in Deerfield, Massachusetts. However, these bounties had existed much more recently, and specifically along the Pennsylvania frontier. Governor Morris had, in 1756, issued a scalp bounty as frontier violence got uncomfortably close to Philadelphia itself. In the wake of Braddock's defeat, Virginia would also institute a scalp bounty, which was in place from 1755 until 1758. The problem with scalp bounties, other than the very obvious morality and brutality of the program, was that people used very little discretion. Colonists would not target enemy tribes, but rather all Indians found themselves in great peril, friend and foe alike. In the case of that Virginia scalp bounty from 1756, when it was repealed in 1758, the House of Burgesses noted, that it encouraged the murder of friendly Indians, just the same as the enemy tribes. In Pennsylvania, there was one report of an Englishman who had married and had children with an Indian woman. He killed her and the three children to try to cash in on the bounty. Well, John Penn would deny the man the bounty, based on his obviously questionable character, Penn did end up offering him a job as a courier and a translator. The Pennsylvania frontier remained a dangerous place throughout 1764. Mutual atrocities continued to be committed on both sides and became the dominant form of fighting in the region. As I said at the top of the episode, there really is not a single major battle drain 1764. While violence continued to rage along the frontier, it always came in the forms of raids and counterattacks rather than something more akin to, say, Bushy Run from the year before. What would really dictate the course of the war, therefore, throughout 1764, aside from the dangerous frontiers, was diplomacy. Thomas Gage was a much different person than his predecessor. Unlike Amherst, he had little personal interest in punishing the warring Indian tribes. 
Gage, now in his mid-40s, was a career military man, originally coming to the colonies in 1755. Along with Edward Braddock, Gage was present for his commanding officer's ill-fated march, along with his future adversaries in George Washington, Horatio Gates, Daniel Morgan, and Charles Lee. However, in 1764, none of them knew yet that they were going to find themselves on opposite sides of the American War of Independence some years later. Right now, what Thomas Gage knew is that he was pretty thrilled to be moving south to the more amenable conditions of New York, rather than his post as military governor of Quebec. Well, Gage would have been far more open to the idea of diplomacy. He was hindered by the fact that, technically, Amherst had not been relieved of his command. This meant that Gage was in a position of, at least in his own mind, needing to follow through on Amherst's plan for the war. After all, Amherst did remain his commanding officer. However, despite his plans to carry through with Amherst's plans, almost immediately Gage discovered how much difficulty there was going to be at getting the colonies to provide the needed men. Now, luckily for Gage, he had some time to deal with this problem. While there was some action along the Pennsylvania frontier, along the northern frontier, there remained a somewhat uneasy truce. The winter had been quiet. Nobody, British nor Indian alike, seemed terribly eager to resume fighting. Likewise, as we are going to see in a moment, there was some limited amount of action between the various tribes. For William Johnson, he viewed the only real plan to bring the entire ordeal to an end as being restoring the power and dominance of the Iroquois, on friendly terms, of course. The biggest challenge to this was that the Senecas were currently one of the tribes actively in revolt against the British. Having a member nation of the Iroquois actively at war with the British did not help his prospects. Johnson, therefore, had to figure out a way to isolate the Senecas. This would allow the Iroquois to get control over their wayward tribe, again, reassert their authority and prove that they are a major power in the region, and finally hope that a strengthened Iroquois confederacy would be able to push the other Ohio and Great Lake tribes towards peace. Johnson moved quickly to completely isolate the hostile Seneca tribe and essentially ice them out. He let them know that he was not interested in negotiating, though he did make clear that refusal to come back into the fold could result in the rest of the Iroquois moving on them. Regardless of their feelings regarding British policy towards native tribes, the Seneca had zero interest in dealing with the remainder of the Iroquois. This plan worked well. The Iroquois were desperate to reassert their authority, and the British were giving them exactly the opening that they were looking for. The Senecas really had very little choice in the matter, and were promptly forced to give up hostilities. After a peace that required them to give up critical tracts of land near Niagara, the Seneca were, reluctantly, back in the fold. From there, Johnson moved his focus to the warring tribes in Pennsylvania, namely the Shawnee and the Delaware. Here, it took very little convincing to get the Iroquois on board, especially in regards to the Delaware. The Delaware had been a problem for the Iroquois for a while now, going all the way back to the peace conferences at Easton during the French and Indian War. The Iroquois Confederacy was more than happy to help Johnson out and put the Delaware firmly into their place. Again here, the British gave the Iroquois what they desperately had wanted for years, a chance to firmly re-establish their control over the Ohio tribes. The Delaware had caused the Iroquois a lot of headaches for long enough now, and Johnson was offering them the chance to finally cure it. Johnson, for his part, did more than just encouraging the mission. He provided the Iroquois warriors with the necessary supplies when they set out in late February. Johnson's plan worked, as the Iroquois warriors were able to drive the Delaware tribes living along the Susquehanna River out. Now, we know that raids were still going on beyond February 1764 along the Pennsylvania frontier, so it would not be fair to say that the war had wrapped up. However, 
it was the Iroquois involvement and the success along the frontier that explains why there were no large-scale engagements during 1764. Henry Bouquet reported minor skirmishes around Fort Pitt throughout March, but nothing major. Bouquet did receive warnings of a potentially larger attack, however, these never came. Rather, what developed was the bloody, though limited in scope, raids that we talked about earlier today in the frontier communities. Bouquet, who by this point was more than a little frustrated at sitting idly while the frontier attacks continued, had little he could do. While he was itching for an offensive operation, it would have required men to be provided from Pennsylvania. Unsurprisingly, the Pennsylvania Assembly continued to drag their feet. While well, Bouquet sat around fuming over the continued lack of support, Gage also had to consider the northern front of the war. With the Seneca sufficiently chastised, and now at least nominally back in the fold, Gage and Johnson could turn their attention to the tribes along the Great Lakes. It is, after all, along the Great Lakes that this entire conflict began in the first place. For the northern approach through the Ohio country and the Great Lakes, Thomas Gage gave command to John Bradstreet. Bradstreet needs no introduction to our story. Since being captured by the French and using his opportunity as a prisoner to reconnoiter Louisburg during the War of Austrian Succession, to his daring victory over Fort Frontenac during the French and Indian War, Bradstreet has been a major player in our story for a while now. Bradstreet's mission was not meant to be one of peace. This was to be one of punishment. Thomas Gage was far more willing to consider using friendly tribes to his benefit than Amherst was, as we see with the Iroquois. However, Gage is still planning to stick pretty close with the plan that Amherst had originally laid out. That plan called for vengeance. It called for retribution. And Gage did not want to disappoint. Now, Virtually immediately, the mission ran into problems. As was becoming par for the course, Bradstreet commanded far fewer troops than he was promised. Initially, Gage had told Bradstreet that he would be in command of 4,000 men, when the actual number that he would set out with wound up being closer to about 1,400. Despite the mandate for a war of vengeance, the story of the war in the Great Lakes region is not going to be that of massive engagements, but rather one of diplomacy. The first stop for Bradstreet on his journey towards Fort Detroit was at Niagara, where he was going to assemble his men and prepare for the push west. At the same time, William Johnson kept his eyes focused on a diplomatic resolution, and to that effect planned a large Indian summit at Niagara on July 11th. That would have been at the same time that Bradstreet and company were there, getting ready for the summer campaign season. This peace summit was, by any account, a surprising success. More than 1,700 Indians arrived for the summit. Some numbers have those in attendance in excess of 2,000. Considering the slow start by the Indians to any action during 1764, and now this large turnout for a peace conference, it gives us a clue that for the Great Lake tribes, there were many people looking for some way out of their present situation. For the next several weeks, Johnson dispensed with gifts as he treated with the various Indian tribes. This reversal of the much maligned gift-giving policy would likely not have been possible just a few months earlier under Amherst. As Bradstreet left Niagara, he was doing so in the shadow of the peace conference that had seen so many of the Great Lake tribes agree to cease hostilities. They were anxious to resume trade and, though they certainly still had grievances with the British, they also recognized the precarious situation that they were in. Following 1763, the Indians could not have been feeling great about their chances. Sure, the year had not been terrible for them. Indeed, if we had a running scorecard, they were outscoring the British. However, practically speaking, the longer that the war went, the worse it was going to get for the Indians. We know from the Cherokee Uprising 
what happened when their supply of guns and ammunition dried up. The French, despite some attempts to the contrary that we will talk about in a moment, were not coming to help. The Indians were on their own, and now they acutely felt the weight of their limited supplies of weapons, a limited supply with virtually no chance of replenishment. They were not going to win the war, regardless of any successes that they had already had. The British were always going to outlast them. The last hope for many of these tribes that the French would restart hostilities with the British were dashed in April of that same year. Pontiac himself had been busy appealing to the French for help. Pontiac himself had made a final plea to French Major Pierre-Joseph Neon de Vier. While Neon would listen to Pontiac's passionate pleas for assistance, he remained unmoved. The French would not be rejoining the war. They would not be giving supplies or aid in any way. The only thing that Neon would provide Pontiac was the advice that he should return home and not reopen the war. Therefore, as Bradstreet left Niagara, despite the initial push towards punishing the Indians for the war, it had soon become clear to him that the desire to fight amongst his adversaries was waning. Sure enough, after leaving Niagara on August the 8th and moving across Lake Erie, it took only two days before the First Peace Commission approached him. This first group was made up of Delaware, Shawnee, and Hurons. Bradstreet, rather than conferring with William Johnson, set about concluding a peace himself, telling them that before anything could be agreed to, Hostages must be freed, and all the chiefs must be present. As Bradstreet worked on peace negotiations on his march towards Detroit, his captain, Thomas Morris, was busy doing the same. Bradstreet had sent Morris ahead to give gifts and get everybody softened up to the idea of peace. All was going well until August the 27th, when Morris suddenly found himself surrounded by warriors directly under the command of Pontiac. Though, as it would turn out, it was now Pontiac himself who was ready to talk. Pontiac spent some time trying to convince Morris that the French were getting ready to join in the fight. However, this was obviously a bluff. Pontiac had been personally told by Neon some months earlier that it was over and that the French were not going to be getting involved. Pontiac informed Morris that while he would not personally agree to peace, he also was no longer going to participate in the war. For Pontiac, this was as close as he would come at that time to declaring peace. Then, much to the very considerable relief of Morris, he allowed him and his party to leave. After leaving, Morris and company continued on their mission of handing out gifts and making peace overtures. As an interesting side note, at one of these villages, the men came across a great white horse. A white horse that had last been seen in 1755 underneath General Braddock as he marched towards Fort Duquesne. Meanwhile, Bradstreet arrived in Detroit at the end of August, feeling pretty good about everything. He was winning the war with diplomacy rather than with the musket. The problem, however, is that really is not what Bradstreet's job was. Recall, just a little while ago, I mentioned that Gage wanted Bradstreet to lead a punitive expedition, not become some emissary of peace. Bradstreet would learn of Gage's annoyance well in Sandusky at the end of September, where he believed that he was about to enter into a peace treaty. The letter he received from Gage angrily reminded him that his orders did not give him permission to conclude a peace with the Delaware or the Shawnee. Gage let him know that before any peace could be concluded, those responsible for the war needed to be put to death. Bradstreet now had some very real problems on his hands. At this point, Bradstreet really had two options. On the one hand, he could follow his orders, inform these tribes that he was negotiating with that he now needed to put their leadership to death, and see how that turns out. Bradstreet guessed, likely correctly, that it probably was not going to turn out good. 
the second option was to push forward with the peace, despite his orders. This would have led to a court-martial which, Bradstreet guessed, likely also correctly, would not have turned out well for him. With these being his two options, Bradstreet opted for the always dubious third option, become paralyzed by indecision and do absolutely nothing at all, other than write back defensive letters. Bradstreet by this point was also becoming increasingly aware that he very well may be getting played by the combined Delaware and Shawnee forces. After all, they had not been present at that grand conference held by Johnson in Niagara. They were also taking a really long time to gather up all of those hostages, often requesting just a few more days, just to, you know, make sure they had everybody. Finally, the evidence did not really support that the tribes were all that interested in peace. Even after being approached by the combined tribes on August 10th, they were still busy attacking the Pennsylvania frontier, and indeed, the attacks were expanding making matters worse. As Bradstreet was trying to figure out his next move, down in Pennsylvania, Henry Bouquet had begun his campaign. Beginning the campaign a bit later than he had hoped, largely due to the predictable problems with the Pennsylvania Assembly giving provincial troops and money, Bouquet had set off in the direction of Fort Pitt. Bouquet was aware of the peace that Bradstreet had struck in early August. However, as he marched through Pennsylvania towards Fort Pitt that summer, he hardly saw the evidence of it. Upon arriving at Fort Pitt on September 18th, the same day that Bradstreet reached Sandusky, he found the Delaware were there waiting for him, also seemingly curious if they were all still at war with each other. Bouquet answered in the affirmative, pointing out that they were still raiding the frontier but he did tell them that he would entertain a meeting if they wished. As summer gave way to fall, you had two very different situations forming up. Suddenly, it was Bouquet who found himself preparing to host the Delaware. John Bradstreet, on the other hand, had figured out that this really was not working out for him, and that he was just going to go home. On October 18th, Bradstreet gave the order to return home. Unfortunately for Bradstreet, in the world of disastrous retreats, this one deserves a place in that conversation. Shortly after leaving Sandusky, a violent storm broke out. The men who were going to travel across Lake Erie via boat saw half their boats destroyed. As problems mounted, Bradstreet was forced to abandon the artillery, as it was doing nothing but slowing his increasingly beleaguered troops down. He likewise would make the decision to cut loose his Iroquois warriors and tell them that they needed to walk back to Niagara. On November 3rd, Bradstreet limped back into Niagara with his army in shambles. Oh, and remember those Iroquois who I just mentioned, that Bradstreet cut loose? As a final insult, they would swing around and attack the guards along the path back to Niagara. To say that the luster had worn off John Bradstreet would be an understatement. Further south in Pennsylvania, Right as Bradstreet began his doomed march back to Niagara, Bouquet was preparing for a meeting of his own with the Delaware and the Shawnee. With Bouquet's army moving west and looking rather formidable, the Delaware decided in mid-October that a meeting with Bouquet to discuss peace was probably a pretty good idea. The conference began on October 17th. Well, Bouquet was out looking for vengeance and to collect the leaders of the rebellion, he was very interested in the offer of the Delaware to release all the white prisoners, as were many of the men under his command, whose families were amongst those taken prisoner. Unlike the case with Bradstreet, the Delaware seemed far less interested in playing games with Bouquet. On October 25th, they released over 200 British captives, some of whom had been held for nearly a decade. Within a few weeks, with winter coming, the Shawnee also, though a bit more reluctantly, agreed to a general peace and released their captives. Bouquet, not interested in coming to peace terms himself, demanded that there be an immediate end to the fighting and raids. He ordered that a number of their tribes be turned over to him to be held as hostages, 
Well, the tribe sent official delegations to William Johnson, who would handle the final peace talks. Bouquet had zero interest in copying the playbook of the now much maligned John Bradstreet. Pontiac's rebellion would not end in 1764. There were still hostile tribes going into 1765, though that number was admittedly decreasing. Gage was not interested in the expense of a military expedition to deal with the rebellious Illinois tribes, and instead sent a peace delegation to try to come to accommodations with those tribes. By this point, just about everybody was tired of the war and was looking for a way to end it. Even Pontiac decided to come back to the table in 1765, as he himself had finally accepted the fact that the French were not going to get involved. To be clear, while 1765 did see peace spreading throughout the Western lands, it does not mean things were exactly safe. George Krogan, who was on his way to treat directly with Pontiac, was nearly killed as his group was attacked as they made their way along the Ohio River. Ironically, Krogan's life was saved by none other than Pontiac, who at this point was desperate to reestablish his own leadership and act in the role of a mediator. The tribes that had captured Krogan were far less eager to end the conflict and would have been more than happy to burn Krogan at the stake. Pontiac, however, proved to be a moderate voice and advocated not only for the release of Krogan, but the resumption of peace and trade with the British. With it now abundantly clear that the British were the only show in town, all but a handful of tribes were ready for the conflict to end and for trade to resume. This gambit worked as several tribes chose to defect to Pontiac and bring the war to a close. The remaining hostile tribes, realizing that there simply was no longer the support to continue the fighting, followed the French into their territory around New Orleans and relative safety. A tentative peace was reached on August 28, 1765, with Krogan and William Johnson present. The final peace would be agreed upon the following spring. However, for all practical purposes, Pontiac's rebellion was now over. What had Pontiac's war been about, and what had it accomplished? What were the lasting legacies of the war? The war really had not cleared up any of the problems. Sure, peace was reached and everybody stopped shooting everybody else. However, realistically, the grievances of the Indians went mostly unsettled. Despite efforts, the colonists still had their eyes on to land speculation in the Ohio country. Gift-giving was back, which the Indians were surely happy about. However, concerns over land rights is a problem that really will never go away. On top of that, however, as of right now, we cannot fully analyze the outcome of Pontiac's rebellion because we still don't have the full story. Changes were happening back in London during the fall of 1763 that would profoundly change the relationship between the crown and her colonies. To fully understand the legacy of Pontiac's war, we need to consider the political ramifications of that conflict and just what it would mean for the colonists. Because just as Johnson and Krogan were bringing an end to the rebellion, the colonists' attention was shifting towards other matters. Specifically, an increasing uproar was forming regarding a required stamp on all paper products. Next time, we are going to move back to the fall of 1763, where we will address the political changes happening first in London, and then back in the colonies. Not only will these political changes help in defining the legacy of Pontiac's rebellion, but they will begin to redefine the relationship between the crown and the colonies. Until then, I hope you all have a wonderful two weeks. I hope that you are staying healthy and staying safe. And I will see you back here next time as the British begin to reconsider their colonial policies. <laughs>